Okay, let's see. Lots of activity in the chat. So back to class. I'd say the most used tool in the fab lab is the laser cutter, uh, followed by the 3D printer. This week is on a much less widely covered process, but a really versatile, powerful one and a really important industrial one. This week is molding and casting. And so to start, I'm going to show two examples. This is Alex Schaub in Amsterdam. Uh, he did a great project to make this foosball table. And then as part of the project, he, he made the foosball players. And so here he's machining machinable wax. Then here he's making an elastomer. Then next, he's doing insert molding. He's casting them in place on the shaft of the foosball table. And then here is the lineup of the foosball players. And so if you look at these, they're dense parts with a beautiful surface finish produced in a series and cast in place. Um, all of which is at the limit of what you could do with a 3D printer, um, but is fairly straightforward as molding and casting. Um, feature assignment for this week is Adrian. And uh, he went crazy this week. Uh, he, uh, he, he likes trains, he works with trains and uh, for this week's assignment, um, again, here's the mold, uh, the rigid mold, the flexible mold. Um, this is, I'll talk about all of these in more detail. This is a smooth castable material, smooth cast um, that makes uh, plastic-like parts. Actually, what is onyx fast, Adrian? It's a um, uh, resin black. I remember. Okay, I, I don't. The, I have the data sheet in the in the top of the <laughs> of the okay. website. Is is from uh, but, gold, Neil. But then uh, here he made candles. Uh, this is with a concrete like material. I'll talk about. And then here he made uh, chocolate. Uh, so e edible trains. And so making candles you can light and chocolate you can eat again, is borderline beyond 3D printers. And all of this just comes from making the, you know, one mold, but casting other material. Um, let's see, Ahmed, what it, was this example? Um, was this more foosball? Uh, yes, exactly. The figure is the ball and the handles. Oh, OK, all, all, all other parts of the foosball system. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, and so. The power of this week is uh, you can do short run production, you can get beautiful surface finishes, and you can work in a much wider range of materials than you can print, all by making molds and casting. And so you're going to make a mold, cast it, and produce parts. So. Uh, this is an example of a tabletop injection molding machine, a, um, a little one you can have in your lab. You know, it, 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 if I look around at, say, these scissors or this uh, loop, uh, you're likely surrounded by injection molding parts. That's where you heat a material and force it into a mold. And so just terminology, um, uh, sprue is where it gets injected. Runner is how it gets distributed. Gate is where it goes into the mold cavity. Vent is where the air comes back out. A parting line is a seam you can get where the mold face joins. And if you design it carefully, there's no parting line. And if it's a bad mold, flashing is material that leaks between the mold. If it's a good mold design, there's no flashing. So that's what you use for higher volume production. Uh, insert molding is where you put something in the mold. So when Boss did 
uh, this class, he had made uh, this uh, programmer, but then rather than making a case for it, he did this really neat thing where he made a mold where you put the programmer into the mold and then you cast this right around it. So rather than mounting in the case, you actually embed it and cast it. And this is a great way to make uh, electronics environmentally robust. Uh, vacuum molding is a tool like this. And there've been a few projects uh, in fab labs making uh, open vacuum formers. In fact, we saw one in the machine building week. Uh, here, you take a sheet of plastic, you heat it, then you pull a vacuum and it pulls it around something. And the, the main killer app for this is packaging. Lots of products come with vacuum forming. You can also use it to make larger molds, um, but generally at lower resolution than other processes we'll talk about. Um, blow molding is how bottles get made. Um, instead of uh, vacuum forming, you inflate in the mold um, and to make a bottle. Uh, roto molding, uh, uh, Severio, actually Severio, are you on right now? Um, Se Severio in Shanghai um, for, uh, did this for his final project. And so he's pouring resin into the mold, but now rather than the mold staying still, uh, the mold is gonna tumble. And so once he gets it going, it's tumbling in multiple degrees of freedom. And then when you take it out, what it does is instead of um, uh, sinking to the bottom of the mold, uh, the tumbling drives it to the surface of the mold. Um, and so that's uh, to do uh, roto casting. Uh, uh, vacuum and pressure assisted molding uh, is important for composites, we'll talk about later. Um, when you have a mold, there can be complex features to get into. So in pressure assisted molding, instead of just pouring the resin in, you push it in under pressure. In vacuum assisted, instead of just letting the air get put um, come out, you actually suck that out uh, with a vacuum. And so those are important for composites. Um, uh, investment casting is doing this with metal. We'll see an example of that. And for this week, our focus is going to be on soft tooling. So, um, uh, here's a nice example from this week's assignment. So, uh, this was a machine controller looking like a, a nice finished uh, product. And so, here he's machining the wax and using that to cast the frame. Uh, but then the really neat thing, so, so that, that's one casting. Then the neat thing he did is this is the mold for the keypad. And to do this, he filled one material at the bottom of the letters and then another for the rest of it. And so he gets these three different colors. And when you're done, he makes this um, very nicely uh, finished remote control. So all of that's uh, uh, an example of the molding and casting. And then this was a fun assignment for this week. Uh, Janice liked cats. And so she made a simple mold to make a cat. Um, but once she made the mold, she can do a production run. And so here are some of the painted cats. But here's a whole series of cats made in different materials. And then uh, here are chocolate cats. And so you'd need to leave a 3D printer running for quite a while to produce a series like this. Here she can keep cranking them out of the mold. And again, this is at the state of the art of um, uh, 3D printer performance to get this sort of, sort of finished. But a, you know, instead of a $100,000 printer, a $1,000 um, milling machine can give you that kind of surface finish. So short run production. So molds can be complex. This was a project in my lab where to make um, these parts here, it was actually a 12 part mold 
uh, in this NASA collaboration to make those really complex parts. Um, here's a, a little bit simpler, just in the class. Uh, what he wanted to make was a tesseract, which is a 3D projection of a higher dimensional um, uh, figure. So this is a, a, a 40 cube in 3D. And if you look at this geometry, you wouldn't think like a mold can make that. But the neat thing he did is he made these building blocks and then they all get assembled into a cube. And then you cast the resin and you get this. And so what you need to think through is as long as there's directions you can project, you can do much more than a one or two part mold. You can have multi-part molds that let you make really complex uh, nested uh, geometry. Now, to do that, um, the alignment matters and I'll talk about alignment. And so in this case, uh, he was casting these um, really nice glowing LEDs. And so to help the mold, he made a frame and the frame holds the parts in place. Um, here's a simple example where uh, this is a self-inverting top. So uh, when you spin it, um, uh, it, it turns upside down. And so there's actually a number of things going here, going on here. So there's two parts to the mold. Uh, the bottom and the top. Um, they're, they're machined smoothly. And then it, we'll talk a lot about casting. And you see the casts came out very smooth. Uh, if you look at the mold, uh, what I'm doing is I'm using the shaft here as the fill. So rather than having a separate place, I'm, uh, the, the, the material I'm casting comes in through the shaft. And then you need a vent for the air to get out. And so this post is, makes that little hole for the vent. When I'm done casting, I get a little post sticking up there. You just um, uh, snap off. And then there's two other things going on here. One thing I'm doing is it's common in mold making, let's see, let's go back to Alex's example. It's common to see, um, if you look at the mold, you'll see these little uh, bumps. And so what those are there for is uh, you have bumps on one side of the mold and they go into cavities on the other side of the mold. Um, but I don't recommend that. Uh, and the reason I don't recommend that is if you look at this design, you don't see those. And the reason you don't see them is instead what I'm doing is I've got one side of the mold. Um, and I've decide, decide, designed the mold. So I've got a complete um, rim where one whole mold completely fits in the other mold. And so this whole mold face fits in that whole mold face. And what that's doing is now I'm using the complete periphery of the mold to hold it together. If they don't register, you get flashing and parting lines. But by using one whole side of the mold to register the other side of the mold, I align them much better. And then the other thing I've done is if you look at the tippy top, um, it looks like um, this. And what I did is the, the parting line is right there. And so um, the mold faces fit right here. And so the parting line is right at that edge. And so there's actually a little tiny seam there, um, but you don't see the seam because it's right at the edge. Um, if I had put it anywhere else, you'd see a band going around it. 
but I put the parting line at a particular location where you wouldn't notice it. So all of that's part of mold design to give you a part that's nicely registered and there's no artifacts between the mold faces and there's no visible uh, parting line. And then uh, we're doing soft tooling. The reason we're doing soft tooling is uh, this is a rigid mold. Um, if you have a rigid mold, it's hard to get your part out of it. And I'll talk about that when I get to mold design. And so if you look at what's going on in this picture, because it's soft tooling, you can just uh, bend the mold away. And so it's much easier to demold. And these are special materials we're using, these elastomers. Um, they don't shrink or swell when you cast them. They, they pick up the finest features and then you can deform them, but, but they come right back to their shape. They, they, they don't have plastic memory. And so that lets you demold by flexing. Otherwise the mold design is much more demanding. So that's why we're doing what's called a uh, soft tooling. So the vendor uh, for this week, the most important one is SmoothOn. Uh, SmoothOn makes all sorts of cool materials. And I'm gonna show lots of examples for things like um, Hollywood special effects. So, um, uh, this, you know, just as this sits, it's showing all sorts of things made with smooth-on materials. So that's the the main vendor for molding and casting. Um, uh, these this is a link to an art supply store. Uh, they make uh, a number of materials for molding and casting for art. Uh, boat builders do a lot of molding and casting. This is a marine store. Um, this is US gypsum. They make the uh, gypsum based materials I'll talk about um, that are important for casting. Uh, Aremco is interesting. They make high temp products. And in particular, um, they make um, molding and casting materials that are ceramic. And so what's neat about this is this is a, a, a material you can make in a mold. You can then fire and make a very hard and high temperature ceramic part. And then Proto Labs as a vendor, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, does this as a service. So you can have them uh, make molds for you and shoot your parts. Um, Jason is asking about glass. So for glass, and actually, um, um, boy, let, let me let me find this. Let me make a note to add um, molding and casting. Uh, I had a, so a, a neat way. Oh, um, um, I'm trying to see if I put it on this page. Um, ah. I do, I do have it on this page. So um, this is a, a good way to do glass. Um, uh, to make uh, glass, uh, it, it's at the high end of the ceramics. So the glass is at thousands of degrees. Um, it's at the high end of the range, even of the ceramics. And so this is deceptively interesting. Uh, to make a glass mold, uh, this is a um, former student, Sam, what he's doing is he's milling walnut, then he soaks the walnut in water. Then when the molten glass comes in, and by the way, don't do what's in this picture. He has his bare hands next to the molten glass. I would wear gloves, but the molten glass um, uh, and the wet walnut carbonizes and you, you get this carbon layer that protects the wood from the glass and actually lets you form the glass in, believe it or not, the wooden mold at, the, at this very high temperature at thousands of degrees. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the, the 
to cast the ceramic, you, you, the moldable ceramic, you can mold just like all of the other materials. Um, it, it, it's like a clay that you're molding and it only becomes hard uh, when you fire it. So in particular, this is a link into the, oh, I have, that's, sorry, that's linked to the wrong place in the inventory, I'll fix that. Um, uh, up top here, I've, this should be linked to the new inventory. And so uh, this is linked to some of the classic um, uh, materials uh, we use for molding and casting. Um, yeah, the it, it's not walnut specifically. It, um, it it's a dense hardwood. Um, it, walnut, I don't believe, is is unique for that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about these particular materials we're using. So. Uh, This is a handy material. This is a wax. At room temperature, it's solid, it's hard, but this softens uh, uh, just above room temperature. And so the way we use this is uh, you soften it with either hot air or hot water, and then you can work it roughly like clay, and then it hardens back down. So one use of this is, um, you know, it, if I had an object and I wanted to copy, say, the shape of the tip of this, I would soften the wax, I would push my material into it, my object into it, I would let it set, and then I take it away. And so it lets you copy the shape of an object. Um, this is also very handy for this week uh, because you can use this. It's very easy to make mistakes in your mold. like you miss and part of the side is missing or you gouge it, um, you can use this to surgery to fix molds that have other problems. The main material for this week is machinable wax. So this is a hard, higher temperature wax. It machines really easily as fast as your mill can go, but with great surface detail. And then very importantly, uh, you can remelt this at a higher temperature. So you never have to throw this away. You can remelt it and use it. And you can take the machining chips and save them and, and remelt them. It, it's moderately expensive. It's tens of dollars for a block about this big. And so uh, there is a DIY community that makes their own uh, machinable wax. And so there are a number of recipes floating around to make your own machinable wax because it's such an important thing for this week. Rigid foam is used for building insulation, but we can use this for molding and casting. The surface is much rougher, so what you can paint it with gesso. That's what's used to seal a canvas. Um, you can paint it with epoxy uh, and paint that on a surface. Um, you can shrink wrap it, so just get rolls of shrink wrap. Um, and you can use hot air to melt the surface back. And what's uh, useful um, uh, for that is if you want to make really big molds for things like architectural castings, uh, the machinable foam is a good way to do that. Um, uh, Simone, the epoxy doesn't melt the foam because you're brushing on just a very, very thin layer. Um, uh, you can machine what wood uh, to make uh, wooden molds, and there's woods optimized for that. Alginate gels are a very funny material. Th this is derived from algae. It, 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 it's a gel. It, if it dries out, it falls apart. It, it stays in a gel state. The main use of this is it's biocompatible. And so um, it, if you want to make like a copy of your hand or your face, and it's used to make face masks, you can, it's biocompatible. So you can push something in the gel and it's really roughly one time use. You make this gel, from the gel, you can make a casting 
in another material, and then that'll persist. The, it's, they aren't really reusable molds. Then urethanes are very useful for this week. So the, the PMC series are urethane rubbers. They're very hard, um, but still flexible. You can tune the durometer, the hardness. Um, they get very fine features, and you can deform them and they come back. Now, for this week, if, if you're casting a hard part, you'll make the urethane mold. But if you're making a flexible part, you might just cast this directly. So if you want to make, for example, custom wheels or a, a flexible part, rather than you don't need urethane to cast the urethane, you can make a flexible part. So urethane makes nice flexible molds. Then they're also in the urethane chemistry family are these um, uh, resins that you cast within it. Um, you don't want to cast urethane, rigid urethane and flexible urethane because they like to stick together. I'll describe other materials. But if you look at these images right now, these look like stone or wood or metal. All of these are urethane plastics and they they're just have dopants. So these are a number of different um, tinting colors. These are a number of additives. All of these are urethane plastics cast in a mold and then um, tinted. Uh, so these are nice materials for casting. I'll talk about safety. They do need good ventilation, unlike some of the materials. Then for clear, um, this is a neat material. This um, is a, a clear rubber. And I'll, I'll let this play because this is a lot of stuff we're going to cover. This is a two-part system. That's typical. Um, I'm going to talk more about these steps, but let's watch this to start. So you, you, you have the two parts that we're going to mix. Typically, it's by volume, so equal parts of them. Uh, we pour one into the other. Then you stir. And the stirring is very important. I'll talk more later. Notice they're not scooping, they're shearing. The, the stick is staying vertical, and they're shearing it. They're not scooping it. Then they're pouring very carefully into the mold. And the pouring carefully is so you don't get uh, bubbles, which we'll talk about. Um, then you let it cast. And then here, when it's done, um, you have that clear rubber perfectly cast in there. Uh, so that's a castable rubber. Um, and then um, uh, this is a clear castable epoxy. And so um, uh, you, you mix it, um, same steps. Um, pour it in the mold. Notice in pouring in the mold, they're pouring slowly and letting it flow through the mold. Then uh, let it set. And then when it comes out, you have this beautiful, solid, uh, clear part. And you know it's clear. And you can also, like in their gallery, you can um, cast um, uh, things within within the clear mold. Uh, then this is one of the best materials for this week. So umu, um, silicone is, is flexible, and uh, what's nice about the silicone is there's no volatiles. This doesn't need special ventilation. You can do it anywhere, and really nothing sticks to it. You have to work very hard. Um, one of the banes of molding is if the material you're casting sticks to your mold and it can destroy the mold. Uh, the silicone is very inert. And so just about anything you can cast in it. And so that's, uh, that's the uh, favorite material for um, making the flexible molds. It's not quite as rigid as the urethane but it does great detail for making all sorts of fine uh, features. 
so, so that's um, uh, silicone. Uh, this is a doped silicone that goes to higher temperatures. And I'll talk about uh, metal casting. Uh, and PDMS is a very particular type of silicone. And this makes the finest features. Um, this gets used to make uh, in nanoscience. You can actually make uh, nanostructures um, with that. You'll see mention of latex, and in general, I would stay away from latex molds. So the materials I've described so far do deep section cures. It doesn't matter how thick it is. The whole thing cures in the volume. Latex is surface. Uh, it needs to uh, breathe to cure. So the way latex works is you paste on a, paint on a thin layer let it set, paint on another layer, and you keep painting and letting it set. And so it can take a week to make the mold. If you rush it and you make it too thick, it doesn't set and it's just gooey. The one good use of latex is, let's say there's a wall carving you want to copy, you can paint it onto an object to pull a mold out from it. Otherwise, I would stay away from uh, latex. Um, for plastics, um, uh, thermoplastics versus thermosets. Thermoplastics are like the uh, urethane I showed you, where it, 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 you mix the materials and it sets, and it, um, a chemical reaction happens. Um, yeah, uh, I'll talk about food uh, in a minute, Hafi. Um, thermosets are materials that you can melt and reuse again. And so, um, uh, this is a link to a range of thermoset polymers. Um, and the um, uh, thermoset polymers, uh, you can uh, uh, soften and remold. Then these are two of the best materials for this week. So uh, this is dry stone. And this is a calcium sulfate compound. Um, this is used for desiccants to dry. You actually eat it, believe it or not. This is used in um, uh, sustainability. Let's see, Michelle. I'll talk about um, uh, sustainability. Uh, Michelle, I'll talk about sustainability in a minute. Um, this is uh, used from uh, as a coagulant in food that you eat. This is used in plaster. But plaster by itself has terrible structural properties. Um, uh, dry stone is a plaster-like material um, with a polymer um, matrix mixed in. And this doesn't dry. There's actually a much more interesting uh, reaction, uh, a hydration reaction where the water molecules are taken up in the plaster matrix. And so if we go back to the um, cats, um, the cats here you see, um, that's dry stone and that's hydrostone. The dry stone um, completely dries. It has just a smooth white finish. If, if you look at it, but don't touch it, it looks like plastic. If you touch it, it's a bit denser and it feels like um, stone. Uh, then hydrostone is a, a, a kind of Portland cement. And again, these are really cheap. This is like a dollar a pound. The main cost in this is, is actually the shipping, not the material. Um, uh, and the Portland cement, um, adds to the calcium sulfate, uh, silicates, oxides, a few other material. And that's a bit harder, a bit stronger than the dry stone, but it, it need, it's a little bit more work to dry it. That one you need takes a little longer. You have to uh, elevate a temperature helps. Um, and it has a grayish finish, but it has slightly better mechanical properties. Um, so. Um, both, let's see, there's a question in the chat about jesmonite. I don't know what jesmonite is. Uh, 
Um, interesting. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I, I'm not familiar with Jesmonite. Um, Miriam or Stephen, do you use it? Uh, yeah, we started using it. It's quite popular for uh, art, uh, craft work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So, um, dry stone and hydrostone is great for this week because this is the cheapest of all these materials. It's very easy to cast with it. Um, it it's very low viscosity, so it flows really nicely in the mold. Um, it, let's see, I'm going to mute all, oh, there's background noise. Um, uh, it flows very easily through the mold. Um, it's not good in um, tension in thin shells. They can break. You need to reinforce it, which I'll talk about for composites. Um, but it's, it's very, very strong in compression. And if it's just a slightly thick cast, that then it, it doesn't break. And so Umu, Hydrostone, and Dry Stone is a great combination of materials for this week. That's where I recommend you start. Then for metal casting, uh, this was a nice uh, project in the class. This is using Cerotrue. Cerotrue is a very special alloy. Do you remember I described that solders are eutectics? What that means is um, you have a combination of materials and they ha each has its melting temperature, but when you mix them, it's, it's uh, depressed. Um, that's called a eutectic. This is a eutectic alloy. Um, there are very low temperature metals that are typically lead-based, that are hazardous and fairly soft. There's high temperature metals that need higher temperature casting. Um, this is a, a bismuth tin and ammoni alloy um, that's nice, uh, that's not hazardous, and it has good um, structural properties. So when you cast it, Um, at the end of this exam, these metal parts, they're not quite as ductile or strong as um, a higher temp alloy. So again, thin sections um, can snap, but other than that, they're good solid metal parts. Now the Cerro True, there's a key trick, which is you can cast it in Umu, in, in, in the uh, lower temp silicone, as long as you dust it with talc. So let's see. Um, so this is a minor step, but it's essential. You, you dust the mold with um, a baby powder, and that's doing two things. It's helping protect the mold, but the other thing is it, it helps the, the metal wet the mold surface and stick to it. If you don't do that, you get lots of little voids in the cast, when you dust it with the talc, you get a uniform surface. And the Cerro True, you can pour at a few hundred degrees F, um, uh, which is in the range of that. And that's within the range of um, tabletop uh, toaster ovens. Uh, so that's uh, metal casting. And um, uh, uh, also, uh, Cerro True behaves very nicely to polishing. Once you cast it, you can make a shiny surface by polishing it. Now, aluminum molding is much more dangerous. This was an example of doing um, aluminum casting. Um, Dan, are you on the call today? Um, Dan Meyer has done a lot of this. Um, here, um, this is typically done in oil sands, and this is done. Um, you know, in a foundry where you need a visor, you need um, high temperature protective and uh, clothing. Um, there can't be any moisture anywhere near it or it'll explode. Um, uh, that all of this you need to do in, in a high temp foundry. That's not a fab friendly process. And then, yeah, I showed this example of the glass. So those are higher temp, but the Cerro True alloys in particular at a sweet spot 
that it, it's a lab-friendly tabletop process, but makes fairly nice solid metal parts. Uh, ceramics, I mentioned Aremco. Um, now, one of the questions was about food. So molding and casting food it, it, it is similar to being uh, kosher. That to be kosher, all the steps have to be kosher. In the same way, if you're molding and casting for food, you want every step to be food safe. So I would, you know, start with a fresh machinable wax. Um, you know, I wouldn't use any. You don't need lubricants, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't use an end mill that's ever been in the vicinity of lubricants. And then in particular, Smooth On has a particular set of materials, and this is one I recommend that are food safe. So the food safe is two attributes. Um, one is the chemistry doesn't interact with the food, but the other is the production process makes sure there's no impurities. And so this sort of clear um, makes translucent molds, but in particular, it makes food safe molds. And so this is a great example for this week. You can make custom candy or a neat thing you can also do is you can make custom ice cubes. So you can make, you know, surprise your friends with drinks with custom ice cubes um, uh, using the food safe uh, molds. Uh, then uh, Michelle, oh, let's see, Ricardo, is linking to a page from Dan on um, and student turned guru um, has a lot of experience professionally in sand casting. And so uh, this is him showing, and this shows the kind of protection you need um, to do um, aluminum casting. And so, uh, yeah, Ricardo, I forgot about this. So Dan goes through all the steps of um, uh, making the sand casting mold. Um, then uh, this is a very special foundry microwave to melt it. Don't do this at home, an ordinary one. And then with all of the protective stuff, doing the casting in it. Um, now to Michelle's question, Materiom, led by Alicia in Chile, is um, a, a, a wonderful site for sustainable biomaterials. And so there have been a few questions in the chat relative, relevant to this. So this is taking things like um, shells, uh, agar, uh, coffee grounds, uh, friendly biomaterials, and then have a lot of different recipes for uh, materials you can cast from them. And so uh, this is a good pointer to making your own, own casting materials starting from uh, biomaterials. Uh, let's see, Latin Fab Lab is saying Play-Doh is food safe. Um, <laughs> I never heard of that. So um, we'll see, yep. Play-Doh is a commercial product. Um, of a moldable clay, um, but you can make, and actually I should add a link to this. Um, uh, if you search for DIY Play-Doh, um, you'll find uh, lots of links to how to make your own Play-Doh as a cooking material. Um, yeah, and actually, yeah, this is a good, Good suggestion to, um, th uh, yeah, using this for mold making, that's going to be similar to the alginate. It's not a rigid reusable mold, but it's a one time thing. You could push something into it and get a, a cast from it. But uh, Michelle, uh, Materium is a great resource to experiment with, with biomaterials um, uh, for, uh, to make uh, things like uh, casting. Then, after the mold comes the additives. So, oh, um, uh, so all of these yeah, broken links are when sites get refactored. Um, uh, let's see, the, I think this was be covered on, Here, let's see the yeah okay. Um, 
So what I'm uh, pulling up is there are all sorts of materials you can put in the mold. So um, uh, micro light are little glass spheres that make voids to make your material lighter. Um, microfibers are chopped fibers that help make the material so it doesn't crack in tension. Um, you can get um, uh, like quartz chunks that improve the heat conductivity. You can add uh, nickel or carbon to improve the uh, electrical conductivity. You can add uh, elastomers. So for example, there's rubber concrete where you add elastomers into the concretes to make them flexible. And so there's a wide range of um, uh, additives you can use to change properties of the mold. Um, let's see, this was a link to um, experimenting with uh, biomaterials for molding and casting. So now we come to the steps, which are somewhat subtle. First is the workspace. Uh, this is a sticky, gooey, messy process. So in your lab, you want to have an area that's away from anything that needs to stay clean. It's good to have a big roll of paper you can unroll to make a, a, a disposable work surface. Um, you, um, generally, you need a sink in the workspace. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about your protection in a couple of minutes. Uh, testing is important because these materials have a shelf life after which they go bad. And in addition, they each have different processes to learn to use them. And a really sad thing is if you spend a week making a beautiful mold, and you pour in your material and it doesn't set properly, it can be in a gooey state where it doesn't set, but you can't get it out and it ruins your mold. So any new material for molding and casting, uh, it's very important, just do a little test cast uh, and make sure it, casts, it, it sets properly before you use it. Uh, mixing is uh, very subtle. So again, um, this is an example for UMU. Um, generally, the materials we use are one-to-one -one by volume. Some of the more advanced one needs weight. Here, they're, they're first stirring within the container to make sure they're mixed. Then um, they're, they're pouring them in the one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, scooping to make sure you get everything. And now watch again. Um, it's shearing. It's not scooping that drives air in, it's shearing. Now, when you begin the mixing, there's a strong color gradient. Um, as you keep shearing it while you're mixing, the color gradient is going away. And you want to keep going. Now, if you look at it, it's all, let's see, go back slightly. Now it's a uniform color. You want to keep mixing until there's no striations. Now it's getting poured very carefully in the mold to not trap air. A, con a small continuous bead coming in the mold. Um, then it sets and you demold. Uh, now, one of the ways you can fail this week is, and, and then now this is going to come out of the mold. And then th there's that beautiful cast. Uh, one of the ways you can fail this week is if you stop at about this point. So right now that's two minutes in. And um, they, they um, let's see, I don't know if they give a time, but this was two minutes of stirring. If you stop here and you pour it in, what you actually have is this striated mixture and it's not fully mixed and it won't set. You'll just get a gooey mess. So the mixing goes much longer than you think you know, sort of more like five minutes to make sure it's really fully mixed. Um, yeah, Ricardo, I'll talk about clothes when I get to the safety. Um, you, you don't want to mix more material than you need. So a good trick is put pour water in your mold and use that, pour it back out to see how much you need to fill it. Then each of these materials is 
has a work time. That's how long you can use it. And uh, those range from minutes for the fastest setting material to a typical work time is maybe 10 minutes. So you have 10 minutes to get it mixed and into your mold. And that depends on the material. Then the demold time is longer. That's when you take it out. And so some of the materials it can take a day, but typically the materials we're using, it, it's about an hour is the demold time. Now you saw in those videos, you don't dump it in, um, you pour it very carefully in the mold. And so, um, uh, and it can help to, if you have a two part mold, it can help to tilt the mold. So if you have a mold um, like that, um, it, it, if you're filling it, um, it hits the top all at one go and you can get uneven stuff. And so it can help to um, tilt the mold. Uh, so you're filling from the top and venting from the top. And what you do is it, um, the boundary with the mold slowly walks up to the mold and then gets to the vent at, at very end uh, to fill it. Now, one of the problems that'll happen this week is if we go back to the mold I just drew, um, uh, when you're filling it, air bubbles let, like to get stuck in those little corners like that. And so uh, there are multiple ways to help get rid of the air bubbles. One of the ways to get rid of the air bubble is to actually paint the mold. So before you fill the mold, you, you take a brush and you paint the material to get it into all the nooks and crannies. Um, another one is um, you can actually submerge the mold. You actually put the mold, rather than pouring the material into it, you actually put the mold into the material and submerge it um, can help uh, with that problem. So the other bane of this week is the bubbles. So when you do it right, it looks like this. It's beautifully featureless. Um, when you do it wrong, you get all of these bubbles. And this is a little bit like soldering. You can watch somebody do all the steps and it comes out like this and you do the same steps and it comes out like that. So one of the things that's going on is th this point I keep mentioning, you don't scoop that drives in air, you shear, you move horizontally. Then the next one is when you pour, uh, take your container, um, looking from above, it helps to kink it, to have a little kink where the material is gonna come out. And then when you're pouring, um, uh, you wanna have a skinny bead coming out. And what that's doing is even if there's bubbles back here, the bubbles don't make it through the skinny bead. So you, you pour with a, a, a thin bead. Then when it comes out, um, you can gently agitate the mold and sort of tapping it or um, shaking it can help uh, the bubbles come out. Uh, a vacuum chamber is a common solution. You, you put your mold in a vacuum chamber and you pull a vacuum and that sucks the air out of the mold. Um, you can also do the opposite which is you can use an overpressure and you push it in um, by having an overpressure rather than a vacuum. And some materials prefer, prefer vacuum, um, some prefer overpressure. And the most important thing is, is time. Uh, one of the most common ways you get bubbles are you rush. So when you mix the material, before you pour it in the mold, if you just wait, bubbles will rise to the surface and then you can scoop them out and then wait a little longer and some more will come and wait a little longer and some more will come. And so a common cause of bubbles in your mold is just that you rushed the process. And so just wait to make sure the bubbles, you, you know, as long as you're within the work time, wait to make sure the bubbles come out um, before you fill the mold. So then, then your material cures. So the, the plastics polymerize. 
um, the this calcium materials hydrate. Um, the, the reactions can have parts that are both endothermic and exothermic. Um, the endothermic means uh, it can need heat activation. So for example, the urethane plastics can take overnight to set at room temperature, but if you heat them very slightly um, in a warm toaster oven, it, it'll do it uh, in about an hour. Now, don't use a toaster oven for molding and casting that it, you ever use for food. You want to keep those separate. Um, so uh, hydrostone, dry stone, umu doesn't require it, but some of the plastics um, need an elevated um, temperature for the, the curing process. And that's similar to think about like bread rising. Then on the other side, most of these materials are exothermic, which means they release heat once they're setting. And so when you cast the mold over about an hour, the temperature will go up. And when you feel it get warm, that's a good sign. That means everything is working. And then when the temperature comes back down, um, it means it's ready to demold. Now, depending on the thickness, it can actually be a lot of heat. So um, if you cast uh, uh, a too big a volume of epoxy, it gets something really nasty happens. It gets so hot, it starts smoking. And it gets so hot, it actually will melt your container. And then you have this smoking, um, melted mass flowing through your lab. And so um, when you do deep, really deep section cures, you have to cool it. And so when you make a concrete bridge, it takes weeks to cool it. And a lot of work goes into managing that temperature. And so one, once, once it's going, there's nothing you can do. So you need to be aware of the temperature rise is a signal to you everything is fine, but you need to manage the temperature if you're doing really thick sections. So then comes demolding. Um, if you make a vertical face and you cast a vertical part, it's very hard to get that out of the mold. So one of the things that you commonly do is you make a draft angle. So there's a slight angle like that. If you look at a Lego brick, the sides aren't vertical, they're slightly angled. And it's for that reason, the draft angle helps you get it out of the mold. And then um, this is why we're using uh, the flexible tooling. Uh, so in this example, the part you cast is rigid, but the mold can bend away from that. And then in that case, uh, it can actually bend by quite a bit. You can actually have um, a mold that has an overhang. And so your part is completely underneath it, but you can still bend it away to get that out. So that's why we make the um, flexible tooling. Uh, release agents are to prevent things from sticking to each other. And so there are special mold release materials. Um, you can also make your own, for example, dilute dish, dilute dish soap um, and Vaseline are used as release agents. That depends on the material. You, you need that for urethane in urethane, for example, but you don't really need this for anything in um, silicone. Uh, the, the materials uh, are sensitive. Well, actually, hydrostone, dry stone doesn't depend on anything. It'll last forever. Uh, the plastics depend on temperature. They have a short lifetime after you own that, uh, open them. Um, they have a longer, that's, you know, in say a week, they have a longer lifetime that's measured in, in from months to a year, but not longer than that, even when they're sealed. So you don't buy a huge inventory, you, you buy these as you need them. And when you work, it's important to keep the containers clean. Um, if you have gooey stuff that can begin to set, uh, and you can actually set the containers so you can't even open them. So you want to keep it clean. Now, safety is important for this week. Uh, here's a material 
and it has, this is another clear casting material. It has this warning. This warning is very, very, very serious. Um, the materials that have these warnings, uh, um, we had somebody in a lab in Barcelona use this without proper protection. Uh, he ended up in the hospital, but what's much worse than that is it's a sensitizer. And now his, his body has an allergic reaction to any of the materials in this family. It can actually mess with your body chemistry. These materials need an advanced chemistry laboratory. So a material safety data sheet um, here's a summary of how to read one, is any of the materials we're using come with a safety data sheet. If you go back to um, uh, UMU, when you go to the, um, uh, material, any of these should have linked um, the safety data sheet. Okay, yeah, so bottom of the page. So all of these come to the safety data sheet. Um, this talks through all of the precautions you need to be aware of. And so it's very important to read the safety data sheet. Uh, Umu hydrostone dry stone doesn't need anything. Uh, urethane and epoxy needs good room ventilation. You don't want to breathe the vapors. And something like the crystal clear actually needs to be done in a chemistry hood. Then um, you need to be protected. Uh, this is a messy process. And so even if it's not a hazardous material, you don't want it in your eyes, you don't want it in your mouth. And so generally you wear eye protection just so it doesn't risk splashing. Um, and whatever you do, this is likely to get on your clothing. So you wear gloves, even if it's not hazardous, um, you wear gloves because it's, it can be hard to get off your hands and so gloves to protect it. And you wanna wear clothes that you anticipate can get dirty and messy. And when you're done, you don't wanna put the, the raw resins in the trash. They're, they're um, other than the biomaterials that are not very friendly. Um, but if you mix the materials, then it becomes inert. So any leftover resin you want to mix before you throw it away. Um, uh, and again, one more reason we like the umu because the silicone is very inert. And then the hydrostone, dry stone, those are really just you know, materials that come from rocks and they're very friendly. They're not at all hazardous to dispose. It's just sort of rocks going back in the ground. Now, last part of this week is the design of the molds. So you, you, we had, we've done computer controlled machining, but um, uh, let's see, yeah, Jason, uh, botched cure material is a problem. If, if you have material that fails to cure, um, uh, you, you can't really set it. In that case, I would just try to encapsulate it. So I, I would try to seal it so it, it, it's isolated from the environment. So like it can't leach into groundwater. Um, this is one of my favorite assignments for this week. So uh, what he made is a rattleback. And so this is, this, this is, this looks like an ordinary object, but if you spin it one way, it, it, it turns, um, but if you try to spin it the other way, it's unhappy and it reverses direction. So um, you can spin it counterclockwise, but it refuses to spin clockwise. Now to make it, um, here, what he's doing is it's very slightly asymmetrical. So here are the steps. Uh, he mounts the wax. Uh, here he's using a, a, a hot glue bead to anchor it. Um, here he's machining it. Then look at that mold. You can see what a beautiful, he jo job, beautiful job he did on the tool path, how smooth it is without any artifacts. Then he mixes the materials. 
And then look how beautiful the silicone is. Again, perfect surface finish, no bubbles. Then he does the uh, dry stone. And again, now it comes out and you can see the dry stone is just perfect that um, he's got this gorgeous surface finish and it carries all the way through. And so you have this, this beautiful featureless object uh, made in the dry stone. So what's gonna limit you this week is time on the machine to get that surface finish. So just as a, um, let's see, the uh, rough cutting is where you make horizontal layers and that's where you quickly remove material. That's a two axis process. The, the end mills cut most effectively on the side. Um, step over is the spacing between paths. And this is a coarse step over um, and, and you'll see the overlap. And then this is a finer step over. And so you're gonna do two axis machining for the rough cutting and then three axis machining for the finish cutting. Now, there's a number of types of end mills for this week. Um, uh, th this is a link uh, uh, that'll take, take you into the ones I'm gonna talk about. Um, uh, flat end mills versus ball end mills. Um, uh, a, a flat end mill side view looks like that. Ball end mill looks like that. Ball end mills, it's usually assumed you use them for finish cuts, but that's misleading. Um, if you have an angled surface and you make steps, a flat end mill looks like that and a ball end mill looks like that. But if you have a, a, um, an angled surface and you're making a three axis uh, path, moving all three axis, you can make a continuous surface with a flat end mill. The ball end mill on a bottom surface will always give you bumps where the flat end mill doesn't. So, Flat end mills can give you curving surfaces. The real point of the ball end mill is um, because of the radius of curvature, a ball end mill could get in here where the flat end mill would hit the side. So ball end mills are more useful de depending on getting into the radius of curvature. You can make smooth surfaces with a flat end mill. Now, one of the limitations this week is gonna be if you use a skinny end mill, um, the depth of cut may be shallow, so you can't make a deep mold. And if you have a big mold, it takes a lot of passes. So you want to avoid a, a, a mold that has very deep but very skinny features. Um, you want to try to um, design the mold around the end mill you're going to use. Um, make sure you design it around the depth of cut. And also remember the end mill um, has a shank that then goes into a collet and you don't want these to collide. And so you can use that by having fairly large features. You can also help minimize that by angling it. So when the tool is here, um, the shank doesn't cut. Uh, so there are extra long end mills to make skinny features, but they flex and um, so you really want to, so they limit how fast you can machine. Um, uh, and so the key depth for this week is going to be the cut depth for your tool. Um, now for this week, I want you to design with full three axis tool paths. So uh, you can use VCarve on a ShopBot, Fusion has good tools for that, uh, SolidWorks, they both have tools in general, but they have tools in particular for mold design, uh, FreeCAD. And then this is an example in mods of um, uh, for this week's assignment where um, I'm first going to do the rough cutting. Okay, and, and so here's the toolpath. And then if we look from the side, you'll see 
it's moving in layers and then plunging between the layers. So that's to rapidly remove material. And then the key thing for this week you haven't done yet in the preceding weeks is the uh, finish cutting. So here, uh, and again, all of the tools do it. Here I'm doing it in mods. So uh, now you can see this is the full three axis uh, finish cut accounting for the uh, tool size. And so um, here I'm reading it into a toolpath viewer. Um, and so that, that's the finish cutting. Now you'll see I'm doing a very fine step over. Um, the quality of the surface finish um, depends on the step over. And that's going to, you're going to be limited just by the machining time. Uh, see, Ricardo's sending a note about easel. Ricardo, I'm not familiar with what, what easel has done. Uh, so as a group, first review the safety data sheet. Every material you're using, read the data sheet so you understand the difference between safe, safe and hazardous materials. Then do test casts. And so typically I'll just take like, um, you use often mixing, disposable mixing cups mix up each of the materials, make a little test cast, and just make sure you can cast it properly. Then you design the mold for this week. Don't, don't download anything. Um, start in your lab. You need to design the mold around the stock. So make sure you know what size stock you're using. Then you need to design the mold around the tooling. Don't design the mold and then pick the tool. Um, pick the tool you're going to use and design the mold so that it's machinable. Then uh, mill it, rough cut and finish cut, and cast the parts. Um, the, the simplest mold is one part, but that gives you a rough backside. Um, Better is a two-part mold. And then more ambitious is if you go beyond a two-part mold, you can make a more complex geometry. And for materials, start with Umu hydrostone dry stone. Uh, um, your lab should be set up to demonstrate the metal casting, and you could experiment with that. And then beyond that, you're welcome, as long as you check safety in the lab, you're welcome to experiment with the other kinds of materials, like, um, for example, the uh, food safe for the week. So in the end, this should be, this is one of the most creative expressive weeks, and it opens up a whole universe of things that aren't commonly done in maker spaces. And anything you do this week has a smooth transition into mass production, that from your prototypes, you can go to somebody like Proto Labs and have production runs done of the molds you designed for the week. OK, final questions or um, let's see, questions in the chat. Um, uh, let's see, V-bits are terrible for this week because um, uh, th th those are good for isolation, but they're not good for giving you continuous uh, surfaces. Um, the, uh, there are tapered end mills uh, uh, that are used for this week, for example, for the tapers, uh, but you do want to have um, not a V at the bottom, otherwise you get features from the, the pointy tip of the V. Um, any other questions or comments? Hey, Fee. Yeah, I was just wondering if I understand correctly, like the Unmold, we cannot download, you have to design everything from scratch, you cannot download anything for... Uh... Well, it, it, it's, it's not that you can download nothing. Um, there can be features you start with, but, but the key thing is I want you to design the mold, meaning yeah. the mold design includes how the faces fit together, yeah, um, of course. how you fill it, where the vent comes out, all those properties I want you design. Um, so if, if there's something you want to start with for what goes in it, that's okay. Okay, so for example, like 
let's just say uh, I want to make a mold for a finger. Can I start with uh, uh, um, a 3D file off a finger and then make a mold around that? That's fine. Yeah. Meaning okay. the, the, the important thing is, 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 is learning how to design the mold, but that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to yep. be sure. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Uh, Jason? Yeah, sorry, I had a lot of questions, I guess, but uh, I had a double header. Um, okay. One that I've been dying to ask you since 3D printing week and finally seems like it's relevant again on resin safety in relation to like, I know there's overlap between resins used here in casting and resins in 3D printing. Is yeah. the safety essentially same across the board? Well, no, but remember um, th there's no across the board. So in in 3D printing week, I, I linked an article, and this is a prompt for me to show it again. In 3D printing week, I linked to um, this article, and this talks about um, particulates and volatiles from a range of 3D printable materials, and it ranges from uh, PLA basically is perfectly fine regardless to a number of 3D printing materials need um, so chemical safety ventilation. In the same way for this week's assignment, UMU can be done anywhere. The coagulants actually are used in food. Urethane just needs sort of nuisance ventilation. Um, these uh, crystal clear material I showed actually needs to be used in a chemistry laboratory hood. So there's a huge range and it varies for every material. That's why it's so important to um, look at the data sheets for the particular material you're using. There's no general answer. I ask specifically because you also mentioned sensitizers this time around. And like, I know with the the 3D printing resins, the thing I've encountered a lot is that their material safety data sheets seem to be as vague as possible about what's actually being used since they try and have a very proprietary mix. Right. So, so. Um, yeah. So in terms of the sensitizers, the um, uh, for molding and casting, um, uh, you only need to worry about that for you know, a smooth on, for example, not just the safety data sheet. Smooth on is really responsible and any material that's anywhere near that comes with these cautions because they have troubles with hobbyists using them. So none of the materials we're talking about are um, uh, any, anywhere near that level of hazardous. Um, yeah, for 3D printing in general, um, uh, again, PLA is harmless. Um, things like ABS, or the wood fill, um, those need a uh, HEPA fill printers. Um, they don't need outside chemical ventilation, but those need to be used in a closed box with a HEPA filter is, is the level of safety for them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, yep. I was curious mostly about the resin. And then the second yep. question yep. I had um, was just a fun one. Okay, uh, yeah, um, uh, let's see. Uh, what, what, what is the, the question you're asking? Oh, you have another question? It's all the way down. Um... Oh, explain what we're looking at, Hank. It's uh, it's my ceiling. It's a template. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can also you can cast edible cups like this. <laughs> Good. Um, I'll, I'll make a note of that example. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll pick up. There'll be a lot to discuss next week um, uh, as we go through. The, uh, there's likely going to be a huge range of materials people use for this week, and so that'll be a fun discussion for next week. So uh, no recitation this week, Saturday open time. Uh, you're going to be limited by time on the machine for fine step over. So don't spend too long on the mold design. Get, get on the machine pretty quickly. And remember the countdown now to supply side time. Make a schedule for the remaining weeks we have and start filling in what has to happen when. 
Okay, I look forward to seeing what you make next week. Have a fun molding and casting week. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.